welcome to the Southern California Writers Association Craft Chat. I'm Maddie Margarita, your host, here with Diana Pardee on Tech. Um, today, we welcome Nancy Cole Silverman, who's here to help you tighten up your saggy middles. Um, this is for particularly if you've gained the COVID-19 uh, over the past year and a half. Uh, maintain your story momentum and keep your stories revving until the end. Uh, a little bit about Nancy. In addition to writing short stories, she has two series with Henry Press, The Carol Child's Mysteries, featuring a single mom whose day job as a reporter often leads to long nights as a crime solver, and the Misty Dawn series, centering on an aging Hollywood psychic to the stars who supplements her readings work, working as a consultant to the LAPD and the FBI. Nancy lives in Los Angeles with her husband and a thoroughly pampered standard poodle. Welcome, Nancy. Hi, thank you for having me today. And I, I had to laugh when we uh, came up with this title. Uh, Madeline said it's saggy middle. So if you're looking for liposuction, that's not on this Sandus channel. <laughs> A few sit-ups maybe, but I can't help you beyond that. <laughs> so uh, my name is, as you know, Nancy Cole Silverman, and I spent uh, 20 years in 20 to 25 years in in talk radio. Uh, most of it in news. Uh, I did a lot of commercial copywriting and some news copywriting. Um, and when I retired from radio back in the early 2000s, my biggest problem was how am I going to stretch my 75 to 130 word copy to 80,000 words and without that saggy middle. And I really was uh, trying to, like most of you, kind of looking around thinking, what do I do? I've got this great idea. And now it kind of falls apart when I get to the middle. First of all, let me tell you that I've always believed that the story picks the writer. I don't think somebody can say to you, I've got a great story for you and you should go write it. Um, I'm not that way anyway. There are ghost writers who do that. And maybe if I had enough money in my hand, I might, might agree to that, but I find it kind of difficult to do that. Uh, for me, um, I will get an idea for a scene, an idea for a book, and it kind of comes with a, with a flush of inspiration and I'll write down a few, maybe an opening scene. And at that point, I think I've got a picture of this story. And I like to say it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And except the problem is, is you get a flashed picture of that jigsaw puzzle and then it all is thrown on the table and it all falls apart and you've got different, uh, you know, pieces, different places. You've got, you know, blue for the skyline and maybe you've got a little yellow here. And so there's a point of why I'm telling you this is because your story, if you initially get it, you've seen that blush of a picture and then it falls apart as a jigsaw puzzle. And then I want you to take the pieces and kind of put them in appropriate spots. This is gonna maybe be for my opening. This is gonna be over here about my character. Um, a little background, if it helps for you to know, I, as, as uh, Maddie said, I have two series with Henry Press, and those are both kind of uh, soft-boiled and cozy, and I recently signed a three-book deal, uh, and I have just finished the first book, and I'm currently at work on book two in that series, and I am in the muddy middle, <laughs> along with, at the same time, a short story, where I'm also in the muddy middle, so as I talk to you, 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 could be, you can take heart in the fact that I too am going through this very same process. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about once you get that great big picture of what you wanna write about, how many of you have experienced it, right? Have you ever you written a log line? If you can just get a, a raise of hands, have you written a log line? Okay, there's one, two. Oh, somebody, okay, the editor is <laughs> flushing her hair. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that as a yes. If you've not written a log line, a log line is just simply an overall one sentence of what the book is about. And do yourself a favor. Write this as big as you can, post it on the bathroom mirror, post it on your computer screen, post it anywhere you're, where you're driving to work, post it anywhere you can, because everything you're going to do has to answer to that log line. If it doesn't, that's one of the first clues. You're going to go off the muddy middle, kind of off the earth is flat, and you're going to fall off of it. Stick to your log line. Now, that may sound odd when I'm talking about the log line in the muddy middle, but everything must support that log line. You can't fix the muddy middle until you have a really clear idea about what your story is about. And if you're a, how many pantsers do we have here? And do you, are, are there pantsers in there? Or are they plotters? Pantser, uh, right? Pantser, one, one pantser. Everybody else is a plotter. You're, you're a big outliner. 
Okay, great, because this will work either way, okay? Because whether or not you're a pantser or a plotter, if you're a plotter, somewhere in the middle, middle you've started to go, oh, how am I gonna get there? I don't really know what I'm doing. So this is not unusual for things to fall apart in the middle because you get that great burst of enthusiasm. You're starting down that path. You know where you want to go. And then suddenly you run out of steam. So to keep your story um, in, the, in the front of your mind, you want that long line there to ensure everything supports it. And then it keeps you from veering off of it. So I like to think that, and since I write mysteries, that I like to think as myself as the author, that I'm a detective. Now this maybe happens because I also worked around newsrooms for years and as a news writer, you would go out and you would, you would go out on the scene, but it was kind of after the fact. And I've talked to a lot of uh, reporters. They say they really have trouble crossing into the uh, fictional world because they have to make it up. And when you're a reporter, you're actually following the facts. So what you get to do as a writer is you get to think of yourself as the detective on the scene. And who are you going to interview? And so when I begin a piece of work, in addition to the log line, the first thing I want to know is, who are my characters? And so you really want to sit down and you want to make who your characters are. Now, you're going to say, this doesn't have anything to do with my saggy middle, but I'm going to challenge you and say, it has everything to do with your saggy middle. Because when you meet somebody for the first time, Madeline, I really don't know. Madeline, I don't really know you very well. I know we've, we've chatted a little bit, but I don't know all everywhere you've lived. I don't know that maybe you're allergic to peanuts. I don't know if you've been married three times or one time, or if you're engaged and you're going to get married next month. I know none of this. The same thing happens when you meet the characters on page in your first, in your first part of your book. And so I write a very good description of my characters, and that's gonna be the first blush of a description. I put that in what I call my act one part of my character development. And this is before my, paper, my pen has ever really, really touched the page, other than maybe to write a few scenes that got me excited about writing the story. And I wanna know the first thing that you'd know when you first meet somebody. What do they look like? How old are they? What are they, what are they like? What are they not like? How are they related to your protagonist? And one of the things that's very important to do when you do this is make sure you get birth dates down because sometimes you'll start writing something and think, oh my gosh, well, he's not old enough to be your father, not if he was there in 1945. And it's very important that you get down locations, basics, how do they, what does this person look like? Uh, a physical description, the relationship to the protagonist. You know, you would ask these things when you're first meeting somebody, particularly if you're a detective on the scene, do you live here? Can I have your address? How do you know this person? Did you work with them? You don't need to be any more involved than that toward your first part. Because the next thing I do is I start to actually look at this as though there were acts. And as, as you do acts in a play, and you're gonna say, well, I'm not writing a play, I'm writing a book. But the layout is not all that different. There's act one, which is the setup. There's act two which is the conference, which will end with the confrontation and act three, which is the resolution. At each one of these acts, it helps for you as the detective to think, I need to go back and talk to my characters because unless you go back and talk to your characters, they haven't grown and you don't know what they're thinking and where they are. And it's very easy at some point to have actually lost characters, that you've kind of lost track of them or you didn't realize how important they were. You know, it's not at all unusual when you start out writing a mystery or writing a book that you think, oh, I know the butler did it. I'm gonna make sure the butler did it and everything's gonna say. But then you get down to that last part and you go, I don't think he did it. And you're writing along and you just can't make it happen. And the reason you can't make it happen is because you really haven't spent enough time with different characters to know what their needs were. So if, it, if you start to write down the, the act one and the act two and the act three, and then I just throw the kitchen sink into, every, into, every, into a, a series of scenes, things I want to have happen. I don't care if they're in the right order or not. I'll just write a scene headline. Crazy freeway chase, rainstorm, earthquake, engagement party, whatever is going to happen there, and then just don't even worry about where they're going to go, but then start to think about this after you get a bunch of acts down. You've got your introduction, you've got your act one, your introduction, you're, you're, you're setting the scene. We have to know where we are, how many, who we're talking to, and what's going to happen. And then 
bring back your characters, your detectives. Say, okay, this is going to happen. Where are all my different characters and what are they thinking? When you get stuck, put your detective hat on and go back and interview your characters. You can find out a lot of things that you might have missed. Um, the only thing I really, uh, there are rules about my three acts. And the first thing is, is that act one end with, you've created a scene where I know what the problem is. I can't get out of the problem. I can't have the problem restated to me or, or change any other place. It has to be in the end of act one where you've got all your characters. One thing that has always bothered me is if I'm reading a book and suddenly somewhere midpoint in the book, they've introduced a new character that I haven't met and that's the guilty person. I was reading a book the other day and that happened and I thought, that's a cheat. You know, the, the author got all the way through, they didn't know where to introduce them, so they introduced them in the middle of act two. You know, there's gotta be a way to introduce them in act one. And whether they're a minor character or a major character, they could be married to somebody, they could be the baker. You know, when you go back and interview, you find out there's an, a way that you can organically grow that person into your, into your work without it seeming like you've thrown the reader out, which is very important. And when you go back after you've written all of your scenes and it's a bit like a Rubik's cube. This is really, you know, you haven't really sat down and written a whole story yet because this is very hard if you have to go back and rip things out and that's where people get discouraged and that's where people don't finish their books. But if you can sit down and you're working on a, on a, on a developmental outline and then you can go back and you can see where things are not working or they are working rather than say, I'm gonna to have to pad here another 30,000 words because my story is coming in at 50,000 and it's gotta be 80. If you go back and you've interviewed your characters, you have found where places where you can organically grow a subplot and you can organically grow your characters so that they can make more sense in your mystery. Um, I, on my, on my outlines, they're really very brief on the scenes, but they're just enough to let me know what they are. It's the time of day, who's involved in the scene. I, I basically, rather than do a hard outline, kind of talk about fence posting. So I've got my opening scene, and then maybe five or six scenes I'll kind of say that are gonna happen in act one, ending with the real, uh, the scene stating the, the beginning of what I need and what I can't have and why, and, what, and I, then I go back and interview my characters again. So then I fence post it. Uh, and I, I like to throw havoc into my character's life. What, what, what keeps them from getting what they want? And that's just, again, a little, a little line or two that you can move around. Um, if you open up a Word doc and then you open up View, you can uh, put uh, headlines on the side of the page that you can then move around. This is a really easy trick to do. And that way, you may think you don't have to write uh, particularly as you're kind of developmenting your the developmental outline of your book, you don't have to write scenes in order. Just move your scenes around, write them out of order. Sometimes that will give you motivation and then you'll go back. And if you, at the end of each scene, you ask each character where they were, even those characters that aren't in the scene, you may find that a certain character didn't show up because he was off making a delivery and that his delivery van is the van that had showed up at the scene of the crime and you had seen it in the background photos. So there's ways to bring things in that you may have missed frequently as you're just trying to write stream of consciousness all the way through. Um, so organize your, your scenes into acts one, two, and three. Look at them like a Rubik's cube. You know, a lot of times it, that's what you're doing. Give yourself, I give myself you know, anywhere from six weeks to three months to write my basic outline. And I'll look at it and think, okay, this is really great, but that scene doesn't make sense, and yet I love it. And I will tell you, if you're really married to it and you love it, you'll find that sometimes if you move it from one act to the second act or the third act and you move it around or you've interviewed your characters, you're going to find where it settles in there just perfectly. And it opens up and gives you an opportunity to open up a whole lot of new uh, subplot areas. Um, so... Um, when you go back, and particularly when you start to reach this muddy middle, where you think, okay, I, I, I've gotten here and now I don't know how to get, there's this jump, I don't know how to get to my, to my resolution scenes. Pull your characters up, and a lot of times, you can kind of see my office here, I'll pull a chair up right across from my desk here, and I'll, I'll actually ask the character to come into my office and sit down and say, why aren't you telling me the truth? What's going on? 
make questions as though this is a real person in there and see what they say, you know, and just start stream of conscious writing. What, why aren't they, what are they doing? What, what, what minor event has happened in their life that's preventing them from showing up in that scene? Why weren't they in that scene? Where were they? Um, second and third interviews frequently reveal a subplot that's gonna grow organically in your work and really inspire it and maybe even help flush out the, uh, the main, main point that you've been falling apart here. Um, as you progress through your novel, continue to ask yourself how each new scene helps move the story forward because at no point should a scene stall a story. If a scene stalls a story or throws the reader out, you haven't asked the right questions of your, of your characters. You don't need to be introducing new characters. You don't need to be introducing a new location. You need to go back to each character and re-interview them. Again, what you meant the first time, when you meet somebody the first time, you don't know their whole background, but going through your book after each major act or after each major event, if you think, pull those characters back in front of you and ask those questions. If you've got five or six major characters in the book, you should know where they were. If they're married to somebody and their spouse shows up or says, hey, I've got to go somewhere, why do they do that? All of these things, the more you know them, the more, the more avenues you have of understanding them, whether you've written them on a, on a one sheet, and I've got 50 pages of one sheets with character notes and scenes and so forth before I even sit down to start writing, is going to make your writing process that much easier. So Jim, next time you're back at uh, Nano uh, writing, you might think maybe I've had to do this in advance. I could just string through that, that 50,000 words really quickly because you already know your characters. You know what motivates them. You know the three act process. You know you're going to set it up. You know you're going to have the conflict. You know you're going to have the resolution. And then you just start plugging in scenes. And again, interview, 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 just as though you were that detective. Um, so in this, you know, every writer runs into this muddy middle. There are none of us that don't. But my, my summary to you is to create a long line, a log line, create a cast of characters that are, you know, that you really physically can see in your mind. Um, and that's gonna develop, break, the, break your cast of your, your character cast up when you interview them. And what, what do you know in act one about that character? What do you know in act two about that character? And what do you know in act three about that character? Go back and ask questions each time there's a major development plot point in your story because that's gonna help expand it. Fence post your scenes. Don't worry about saying if they're in order or not. When you just sit down before you really start writing, just throw it on the paper, put the kitchen sink in. You can take it out later, but if you start writing, then you're really gonna run out of energy later on. Interview your characters before and after each scene. Um, one of the things I frequently do is I get up from my from a, a project that I'm working on and I'll go for a walk around the block. When you're just too frozen to the screen and frozen to the page, the words don't move <laughs> and you kind of just try to keep working it and that can be very frustrating. But if you get up and go for a walk, or one of the things I do is I'll find another writer friend and sit down and says, I need a little story therapy. I want to sit down. I want to read you my outline. I'm going to read you my outline. Where is where is this falling apart for you? If you can work with another writer and sit down, and read each other's storylines, nine times out of ten, they haven't said a word. All you've got it yourself because you've heard yourself say it out loud. So find a good writing partner, a good group, bring up some ideas, go for a walk, um, and comb back through your story notes. Um, that's where your plots and subplots are gonna come along that are really gonna help you advance your story and make it feel organic and not so contrived that your readers are throwing the book across the room. Or what you've said, if you've realized that two characters couldn't possibly know each other because one's 20 years older than the other and they weren't even in the same continent. This is so important that you do write these story notes down, these profiles down. So why don't I take a few questions because I know I'm going kind of quickly here and I want to make sure I'm answering questions as I go along. Maddie, do you want any, uh, you want to read to me here? I, yeah, we have a few, Nance. Um, uh, let's see, let's get one here. Um, this says, um, I think it happens a lot um, where you know the character in the beginning of the story and at the end, what kinds of things can happen in the middle to show how they've changed? 
um, you know, and it's very important to show how they change because you want to show growth, particularly on the protagonist, but also on the antagonist. So every time there's an event, you know, internally, how does this, how does this character process it? You know, do they, are they, uh, you know, we've just come off of COVID-19 and, and Maddie and I were kidding around us, we got the COVID-19, do you get the COVID-19, those 19 pounds, you know, or, so how are they reacting to the stress of things? Show that on the paper, show that on the page. Uh, or are they, are they just plain absent? Do they just kind of fall into the shelves of themselves? You know, if you don't have that, you don't make it real. And one of the ways that I have found that something becomes real on the page is thinking about, Maybe the event is not at all similar to, to what I've experienced, but if it has, deals with loss, go back through your own, your own feelings of loss and try to pull back a, and write from that lost point of where you felt loss, because it will have, it'll ring more true on the page if you can kind of pull up your own experiences and write about that. Um, but whatever you're doing is, yes, you want, you want to go back and show that, that, that growth. And one of the things you can find is, you can think, okay, there's three characters in this scene and the, the fourth and fifth character, they're not even there. I don't care if they're not, go back and talk to them, ask them. So where were you? Why weren't you there? Because you're gonna be surprised when they come back and start telling you, I uh, didn't wanna be there. Maybe what happened? Well, I was with the guy's wife <laughs> or something. You know, you're gonna find out all kinds of things you can add into there and it's gonna add depth to your story. Don't be satisfied with what your characters are just showing up on the page and, and telling you. Characters lie, <laughs> you know? And the more that you were working as a detective, you know, you're the writer here, you're the detective. You guess what? Don't have all the answers until you ask the questions. So you have to go back to your characters and by keeping a very active, um, character sheet and you're, you're asking them questions throughout the process you're not just saying I've written my character sheet I know they're 35 years old I know she was a journalist I know she graduated from UCLA and that she's living in the west side well, that doesn't tell me anything there's three million people just like that get the details you know who is she who is she been just recently thrown out of a relationship? Is she looking forward to something? Is she coming back from the trip? All those things that you know, and you don't have to write them all down on the page. They're gonna come out though through your story where you're going to go back and ask, you know, Carol, uh, even though Carol wasn't in the scene, well, where were you when, when Mary was fell off the cliff? Why weren't you there? I thought you were best friends. And what does she say? Those are where your answers are gonna come. It's the same thing as a detective is doing when he's really investigating a crime. And then, um, so Jim asks, what if you write too much and need to cut? I mean, well, yeah. Is there yeah. a way not to do that, I guess is the question in there. So what if, what if you write too much? What, what, how do you edit? I, I guess the question, yeah. Uh, Jim, maybe you can type in some clarification, but maybe the question is, um, how do you how do you um, write the middle without writing so much that you have to cut um, thousands of words? Okay, so you're not over explaining. <laughs> you're not kind of over going. Right. You know, less is more. It really is, and you know, a lot of things can be done in dialogue, and some can be done in exploitation. You know, internal thought, um, and you really want to, you know, when you're meeting somebody, think about how people talk. Think, you know, you're in the middle of this story. You, you, you've really got to put facts out there. But when you're talking to somebody, you know, think about overhear conversations. That's one of the best tricks a writer can do is listen to conversations, go to breakfast and just sit there and, and eavesdrop because people don't talk in full sentences. I told you not to do that. I'm not going to tell him the whole story, you think? What do you do? You know, and so you can kind of get that through. And then his internal thought, she never did want to tell me anything, you know. So look back. Put a big red X through it, cut it, paste it, put it on another page of paper and rewrite it. I can't tell you how often it helps to sit down and open a blank page and you've got the other, I have two computer screens going all the time. One is the document as I'm working on it. One is the document, it's the, the section I'm working on and I cut and paste back into it. Because if you open that blank page, magic happens. You say, I've got 6,000 words here. I need to get this down to 3,500. And you can think I can do a lot of this in dialogue. Some of it I can, I saw that I can do it in character, internal character feeling, and other in just in exploitation. So don't 
be afraid of it. You've got something that you can cut back versus something that you think, oh, I've got to go back and fill, <laughs> you know, but everything can be, everything can be improved. You know, one of the things that the, the tricks that writers suffer from most is thinking, I finished my document, I've made my word count, now I'm ready to press and send. Oh my God, don't do that. <laughs> you know, you should be going through that document, just combing through it each, each time you sit down. You're going to go back and comb through and, and pull forward because the more you can comb through and pull forward the more organic the document gets and you're going to be doing this and doing this and doing this until it's kind of like a fine fur that's been combed you've really got it glossy and ready to go okay and then um diana says um she uh, i guess does this writes the scenes in scrivener i have all the scene cards i start developing then write the ones that it inspired me to that day to write that day it worked well for nanowrimo yeah, okay. that would work well for that. Okay, so the then, oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Where the question was on that? Yeah, no, that was that was a comment. And then uh, we have: What are the mistakes writers make most often when writing in the middle or Act Two? Oh, uh, they get lost and they go off on they go off and they think they need to pad, and then they'll go off on a storyline that wanders to a garden, and they expect their readers to go with them, and that's where people put a book down, and that's where people don't finish it. And a lot of times, even if they do finish it, that's where the writer loses interest in it and doesn't finish the book. So when you find yourself at that point and you think, oh, I don't know what I do. So, well, maybe we'll go get lost. In, well, maybe we'll go to Disneyland and we'll get lost there and blah, blah, blah. You know, go back, go back. I guarantee you, call those characters back in as though you were a detective and sit them down and say, you know, I, I just do the old Columbo. I don't really get it. I don't really understand. Why didn't you go with them to the market? and let them talk, talk. When you interview your characters like real people, your story will expand organically and you won't get lost and you won't have to go down paths that take you off 20,000 words that you're gonna lose your listener in. Because your reader in, because your reader is following you because it, it, your initial blush of an idea caught them to pick up this book. The trick is to keep it fresh. And by keeping it fresh, you have to keep the layers, unroping the layers about your characters. And to do that requires that you treat them as real people. And when you treat them as real people and you start asking them questions and you put them on the line, just like you might somebody, if you're really a detective, they're gonna come forth with more information for you that's gonna carry you through your novel. And Frank had um, a suggestion here. He says, how about introducing a big, bad, ugly monster of a conflict or obstacle in the middle? that's worse than the protagonist ever imagined. Ah, that's excellent. Um, one of the things that if you're doing the, the kind of the three act process is done is that, you know, you wanna, you kind of write up to the big climax scene. So everything is boom, 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 boom up to the climax scene. Once you've identified that climax scene, this is where your, your protagonist is going, okay, this isn't working. I gotta do something different. And then you can write down from there. So that's actually a very popular thing to do. Um, you have to have you have to have that point of which you have that scene in the book, which is the climactic scene, which everything your character has thought was going to work and they thought was going to deliver their answer is not working. You know, and so what are you going to do now to save them? Because and then you have to you have to make why is that important? Did the character just say, well, it didn't work? And then when I go, okay, I'll close the novel now and just change my mind and everything will be home. I'll just live with life as it is. It's not going to be great, but it's okay. Or does a character say, well, wait a minute, this isn't working, but it can work if I do this. And what am I losing here? I've got to do it. And you need to remind your reader all the time why it's important to your protagonist. You've got to put that protagonist in peril. And then you have to be able to justify why it's important for that protagonist to be in peril. And all of that should be answered in every scene. It should ratchet it up. Everything should move forward. It should not move sideways. It should not move, it should not move backwards. It should move forward. Whether it moves all the time with the protagonist in the driver's seat or not, doesn't really matter as long as we're learning something about what's happening here in the story. And it answers the log line. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and Mimi says, how do you handle backstories without killing pace? Without killing? Pace. Pace. Ah, you know, backstory is, is pieced out. When you meet somebody, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you everything about me in the first five minutes. You know, the backstory comes out as you get to know somebody. Lots of times, you know, you'll you'll meet a, a good friend and you'll find out that you and you, 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 you like to do things together. You like to go things. And then they'll tell you somewhere along the line, they'll 
you're planning a trip, she says, well, I can go anywhere to Vegas because I uh, uh, worked there once <laughs> and I got a bad reputation there and uh, you know, I'm a gambler and blah, blah, blah. I mean, wow, this just went off in a whole different thing. So those stories, when you first meet somebody, how could we possibly think we know everything about that person? You know, so a backstory has to come out piecemeal and it may not come out easily. It may be that this is part of the mystery of you uncover a little bit of it and then you've got to go ask two or three other characters about, well, did you know she's a part of Gamblers Anonymous? <laughs> and, and he goes, yeah, so am I. Really? <laughs> am I the only one in the room who didn't know that? So there's more ways you can kind of bring these things out. So the best way to deliver backstory is just piecemeal, a little here and a little there with a lot of internal thought. Okay. And then um, Frank says, suggests, how about writing the end of the story first, or, uh, or at least having it clearly in mind? At least you have a summit to climb towards. Absolutely. Don't write, you don't have to write in order. There are no rules. And by the way, just as I say this to you, just because this is what I do doesn't mean it's going to work for you. There are no hard and fast rules for writing. Isn't that great? <laughs> you can all do your own way and, and come up with things for your own, your own style. I'm sharing with you some tips that I think will help you with the muddy middle. And it really gets down to, have you interviewed your characters? How well do you know your characters? And maybe they're lying to you, which I think is very important throughout your book that you check in with them all the time. Uh, but writing out of order, excellent. Excellent. And you don't, you're not married to it. You know, you're going to write this story and you're going to, if, you, if your story is 80,000 words, you're going to go through it a minimum of about 20 times when it's done you know, before you're ready to turn it over to anybody. And by that time, you know, that, that scene may be in there. It may be so massaged. It may be broken up into two or three different pieces throughout the book, but write it. It doesn't matter how many words you write a day. It matters that you write a scene every day, several scenes every day. Don't worry if they're the final scene. They're not going to be the final scene. Don't worry if they're scenes you're going to keep. You may not want them. You may throw them out, but you're writing. And the important thing is, if you want to play Carnegie Hall, you got to dance. You've got to be practicing every day. You want to be a pianist, you've got to be practicing. You want to be a writer, you've got to be writing. So you can't just sit down and say, I can only write when inspiration moves me to write. You have to sit down and write every day. So write those scenes. If they belong there, fabulous. I don't know anybody who's really can sit down and just write one draft of one book and have it be a bestseller and do it in one draft. Okay. Um, here's another one from Diana. Is, is it important in any genre for the protagonist to face a turning point or a mirror moment? What are some ideas for building the tension to that point? Okay, I think it all depends on, on what your subject is, but yes, there is there is no problem with it having to be a mirror point where she turns around and goes, I'm wrong. This is this is a this is the aha moment. You know, you can have it, you know, it also is an aha moment for your reader is gonna say that she, the character really developed, they were going down the wrong path, but what are they gonna do about it? So that's you have to have a solution. So you can write up to that. There is that aha moment. That's not working. Now here's what I've got to do. And how is she going to do that? The best ways I have found is to have, well, anytime you have a, a to have a, a secondary character there that she can bounce ideas off of and then finally can say, oh, well, okay, that didn't work. But if we go back here, we can make it work. So yes, there's not a problem with that. Again, there's no fast hard rules on these things. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, how, how do subplots feature in Act Two? How do you manage multiple subplots in the middle? So they don't get confusing and boring. Okay, that's a good question. You you know you you don't want to overwhelm your reader with subplots because the subplot is not the plot. Uh, you know I wouldn't have too many. I you know I have one maybe two subplots and one is obviously more important than the other. Uh, and they're they're kind of just threads. Um, I was explaining to somebody, to read, but laying out a book is a little like laying out a pattern. If you're going to weave a rug and you say, I'm going to do, you know, so many, so many oranges and threads and oranges and yellows and, and sand color threads. And then I want to introduce a red thread here, but you're not going to introduce the red thread all the way down in the bottom of the middle. You want to introduce a little subtlety of it up here. So you can have that. It's, it's sub, that's a subplot. It's, Bring it out, you know, maybe somebody's you've got somebody who's planning a wedding in the middle of this investigation and that's, you know, that's something that's going to take place and from time to time. Your characters go off and they're doing some wedding planning and they come back and there'll be a line or two and then maybe at the very end after everything has been solved. They have the wedding they go off to the wedding and that's part of the subplot. And the, the secondary subplot of that is 
is mother going to come? <laughs> you know, so you it, it it's all how you want to work it. Okay, um, this is on here, but um, so what if you're a um, a plotter? So you're not you know where you're going basically um, okay. in terms of getting from the beginning it, where you are at the beginning and where you are at the end. What kinds of actions and what kinds of things have to happen in the middle? to make it interesting? What kinds, what, what suggestions, what twists and turns and things can you suggest that people can use in the middle to make it interesting to get to that point and to relate it, like you said, to the log line? What well, okay, you again, is you, you get your log line, so you know overall what's gonna happen. You know, um, the uh, latest uh, in the news series is the daughter goes to, to uh, to Hungary to meet her father's rescuers and discovers a group of art thefts, okay? Uh, so everything's got to support that. Um, what you're gonna do is again, you get down to that first act, you want to introduce all your major players in the first act, and then everything has to work against your protagonist from her getting her goal. It doesn't matter what it is, is you can have a, her riding a roller coaster, you can have her on a ship that's sinking. And you want to throw so much stuff at her that she's got a challenge and she's got you've got to you've got to cheer for her to want to get to her goal. And how are you going to do that? You, you show her overcoming. This is a great way to show strength. So whatever you're going to throw at your client or your client, <laughs> your, your protagonist is, is going to really upset her and, and, and put a roadblock for her. It doesn't matter what you do. You want to you want to make it difficult for her to get to that climax scene. So when she gets to that climax scene, you think, okay, she's going to get there. She's going to get there. She's finally got to the top of the mountain, and she falls. <laughs> you know. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you put in there. It's whatever your story wants to put in there. Whether you're writing a story with with you know outer space, or you're writing an emotional thriller, or she's being chased by you know, some hijacking group, it's up to you. Just make her suffer, make him suffer, make them want to climb this mountain. Okay, I put one in. Um, how do you know if your log line um, supports an entire book and that the motivation is strong enough to propel you through 300 or 400 pages? So not only through the, the beginning and the end, but the middle as well, that it's, that it's strong enough or the motivation is there. So people understand why all these different things are happening. Well, again, you get to your log line and, and you know, you're, you, I don't think I want to sit down and write a log line in 30 seconds. You know, it may take you, it may take you a while to write a log line long, but it may take you a, a week. It may take you a month. It may take you three days. You know, you're kind of wandering around thinking, okay, what, what is the purpose of my story? I've got this idea. You know, when I wanted to write The Navigator's Daughter, which is the new book coming up, it won't be up till next year, I wanted to write it because when my father was dying, of a, was dying, he had gotten a letter from a man in Hungary that said he'd found his plane that was, had been downed in World War II, and he wanted my father to come see it. And I thought, well, what an interesting story idea. I should write something about that, and I had no idea what it would be. And, you know, I kind of sat around and, and, and thought about it for a while. And about six weeks later, I because it was in the back of my mind. That's writing, by the way. That's the be real. The be real is always going on. People say, oh, well, if you're not writing every day, you're just writing all day long. You should be doing 5,000, 3,000, 1,500 words a day, 2,000 words a day. No, writing is kind of working the, the minutia, getting it out there, coming up with a good long line. If the log line is true, and you start putting scenes down, and I break it up again back into the acts, you're gonna act one, two, and three, you're gonna have enough there. You know, frequently it isn't that you have to have so much action, it's that you have to internalize it. Because you're, how does the action play out to your reader? Is it real? You know, it doesn't have to just be like a, a graphic novel where you're, or a graphic um, cartoon clip or something where it's booms and explosions and everything, but it has to resonate with your reader. So sometimes less is more, you know, you don't have to have so many car chase scenes, but it has to resonate with your reader as to why the reader feels worried and in fear for your protagonist. What is happening? What, why, why is it important this woman do this? Why do you cheer for her? There's, no, there's not too much or too little you can put in there. It's all how you do it. This is the craft. I just, uh, for everybody's clarification, can you talk, we've talked about or referred to log lines a lot. 
Can we talk about exactly what a log line is and what it should have in it so that when you're looking at it to guide your whole story, you know that you're guiding it in the right direction? Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Because I think a log line, you don't wanna to put too much in it. You know, a lot of times if you pull up the, the best sellers, I, my, my, I kind of cheat and pull up the best sellers on the New York Times sell list. That little brief sentence description, that's a great log line. It just tells you. Carol goes to Kansas to, uh, to fight for clean water, you know, or, and, and what happened, you know, it doesn't have to be anything more than that. It doesn't have, we're not writing a summary or a synopsis. Okay. That's another matter. By the way, when you do the, the, uh, the three act structure and you put in your, your scenes and you've got your characters, when you're ready to write a synopsis, it goes together like Cracker Jacks. It's really quick because you can just take those scenes and just kind of cut out the word scene and kind of go boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden you have an, an expanded summary for yourself, synopsis for yourself. Did I answer that question? I'm not sure if I got sidetracked there. Yeah, well, I, I guess I, part of the reason, you know, I, it's taken me so long to write um, this story is I don't think I was clear on the motivation Mm -hmm. of why everything, why it was important to her. I knew what was going to happen, mm -hmm. but I didn't really understand what her relationship was to everything that happened in the story. Mm -hmm. So I, had, I would write great scenes that made me laugh and they were fun, but they didn't really tie into why she was doing or why this was important in the story. And I ended up throwing them out. Um, so can you talk a little bit about motivation? Did you ask her? I beg your pardon? Did you ask her? Yeah. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't ask her. I think that's um, a great thing, but I, I think I never really got the heart of my story until uh -huh. I was working on it. Uh, the uh -huh. emotional heart of the story until uh -huh. I was working on it a while. Uh -huh. So uh, how does that play in? And like when you're going in the middle, you know, all these things have to relate to the story. How, uh -huh. do, you, how do you keep that clear in your head? Well, you have to keep the motivation there and you really do. And so that goes back, that goes back to clearly asking your character, why don't you just go home? Why do you care? And why does that character care? You know, a writing is really as much about self-analyzation because you've got, you've got a character and you'll start to say, oh my God, I feel that way too. I don't want to let me know I feel that way. Uh, but get down to the raw nitty gritty of it and decide because if you feel that way, your readers are gonna feel that way. Your readers are gonna pick up that book and they're gonna spot it and they're gonna they're gonna grow from that. So, you know, you can feel, you, you will feel the reward of it when you write it well. But if you're starting to throw scenes out, you haven't really ascertained what your characters need. I mean, it's really funny, but sometimes, humor works wonderfully by the way, but sometimes it's a diversion. You know, and sometimes you've got to really rip it off and going, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this? And ask her, sit her down and ask her. And those scenes will probably come back. A lot of times people send scenes. If I say they send them off to the green room and that's where I put scenes I don't think I'm going to use later. And I can pull them back later because I've asked someone, one other character about that. And I go, oh, it did go there. It'll fit there perfectly. I need to rewrite it. But the idea is there. Okay. And then um, Jennifer has a question. How do you know if your character is lying to you? Ah. Uh, you know, how do you know if somebody's lying to you? Again, you know, you'll start to figure it out when you start to go through the book and you go, well, she's telling me this, this, and this, and this, but this is happening here. And then you pull them both in and start talking to them and you realize one of them is lying. You know, one of the things that, that is fun to do is if you've read uh, a lot of books where they all, the, the point of view from each character, boom, 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 and you read, okay, here and here, and now Sheila and now Laura, and they're writing the same story as they've seen it. This is kind of where it came from, is writers started this and they started to realize, well, that'd make a good story. Here's the story, and here's Karen's point of view, and here's Laura's point of view, and here's Anne's point of view. And then you wonder, well, what really happened? One of them is lying. Okay. Anybody else have um, any questions for? Um for Nancy? No? Okay, well, um, we have one that says, um, <laughs> Karen says, all your characters are lying. You just have to find out what about. <laughs> you know, I remember when I first started writing, I was talking to somebody and I said, you know, the thing about writers is they're good liars. And she was really offended. She says, oh, no, that's not true. Writers aren't good liars. And I thought, yes, they really are good liars. They know how to construct a lie. And that doesn't mean they're lying, <laughs> but it means they know how to construct a lie. They know how to, to write a good story. So, uh, 
many of your characters are lying or many of your characters are being protective of who they are. And that's what makes them so real on the page. Because if you have a character and she's all 100% good, you're not writing a real character. So, you, you know, we can accept a flawed character. Matter of fact, we'll accept a flawed character more than we'll, than we'll ever accept a perfect character. That's not stereotypical. So you want to show a flaw. You're not going to want to show it and flaunt it right up front, but you can show it throughout. And that just think of all the things you can do in that muddy middle where you're starting those opportunities to show those flaws and to show that worry and to show that but I can't let anybody know for your character. Versus taking that waltz down to the museum and taking the reader out of the story and trying to fill 20 pages with a bunch of fluff. Okay. Go back, interview. Okay, so we have a, a follow-up question on the motivation question. Short of eavesdropping on the character's psychotherapy session, how do you introduce the character's life experience to build that motivation into action, into the action? You know, and that all depends on where the story is going. But if somebody, if you're, if you're walking down, um, or, or let's say you were going to get on the airplane and go to Vegas and the gal says, I can't go. She gets all the way up the door and says, I can't go. I'm afraid of flying or something. And then they kind of go, what do you mean? She says, well, I didn't tell you. And then you can kind of naturally get into that backstory. But don't overwhelm me with backstory. People, you know, people who have a backstory that they don't want you to know about, they, they always say, we'll talk about it later, another time, or I can't talk about it. And then you can ask other people in the book, you know, well, did you know she was that way? And you can kind of get that a little bit. That keeps it going, by the way. That keeps turning pages. One of the things you want to do is you never want to just do a data dump because your reader isn't going to turn pages. They're going to throw the book across the room. So you want to tease it. Everything you've got. You know, when you sit down and you look at that blank page, one of the best things you can do is look down and say, I get to tease you today. I am going to lie to you. I am going to flirt with you. I am going to have fun with you. And you're not going to know what's really going on. Great, because that's what a, a writer's job is to do, is to get, you, to, to get you to follow me along, to get you to believe something and show you something you maybe didn't know, and then, whoo, what do you know? So, you know, have fun with it. Maybe okay. Do. All right, well, great. Um, thank you so much, Nancy. I'm going to um, thank everybody for being here today. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, appreciate <laughs> this. If, if you um, would like to talk to Nancy for a few minutes afterwards about your story, um, we're going to stay around a little bit after we um, end our um, session today. So I want to thank everybody who's watching uh, for being here, and we will see you soon.